is powerful. Um, it, is, it is your job. It is your obligation. It is your act of obedience to intercede on behalf of the saints. You are called to do that. And so Daniel, that's where we kind of left Daniel off. Um, we're going to pick up in verse 12 this morning. Remember that when a Persian king wrote something into law, there was no going back from it. It is what it is. And so even if he wanted to change his mind about Daniel, there was nothing he could do because he had written it into law. And you're going to see this kind of confusion that he has in his own brain because he knows today that he's been duped. He knows that the people who were jealous of Daniel and the power that he had been given used him as a pawn, the king as a pawn, to get their way. And their way was simply to get rid of Daniel so they could acquire more power and more prestige. It's crazy because God uses the kings in Babylon to punish, if you read scripture, typically to punish the nation of Israel. And it's crazy that he uses another pagan nation, the Persians, but typically the Persians he uses to restore them. Um, If you think of the beginning of this book, when they were captured, they took them in three waves uh, off to captivity. In the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, it talks about when they were allowed to come home under Persian rule, they also come back in three waves. So it's really cool that God uses the people that he wants to use for his own purpose. And guys, you are are no different. He will use you for his purpose. And we just have to submit to his will in our lives and allow him to work through us. And he can do simply amazing things. Actually, jump to verse 11. It said, Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. See, the rule was you can't pray to God. You have to pray to the king. Daniel, of course, being a man of faith, will pray to no one other than his God. And so they came and they found that. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days he is to be cast into the lion's den. The king replied, the statement is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed but keeps making his petitions three times a day. God, this man is faithful. Three times a day, he's doing the exact same thing. He is facing the holy city, and he is praying to his sovereign God. Verse 14 says, Then, as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. Remember last week we talked about the king was extremely wise. He placed Daniel in just the the first couple of verses in chapter 6. He placed Daniel basically second in command in this region. He saw something in Daniel. He knew that Daniel was different. What made Daniel different? The power of the living God. And by the way, that same power is inside of you. If you have trusted in who Jesus is, then he has put his spirit to dwell inside you. The power that you read about in the Old Testament that that parts the Red Seas, that delivers his people time and time and time again, the power of healing, the power of all that God is capable of resides in you. It's a shame that we don't understand really fully how to tap into that resource. Um, As humans, we are flawed and incapable of understanding how powerful God truly is, but just think if we could really tap into the power that's inside us in our everyday lives, wouldn't that be amazing? That's why the Bible is able to tell you, don't walk in fear. How many of you have been fearful, like, all the time? But the Bible tells you not to walk in fear. But the only way that we're capable of doing that is tapping into that source that says, you know what, it doesn't matter. Whatever you throw at me, you're bigger than that. 
And guess what? Daniel's again in, in a life threatening situation. And he, he's not saying that whatever you throw at me, my God is bigger than. He's taking it a step further and saying, it doesn't even matter if they kill me because I'm going to be with my God anyway. Gosh, that's good. That's good to know that you know that you know that when you leave this place, you begin your eternity with your heavenly father. And so it kind of puts everything into perspective that you know, let the world do what the world wants to do. You have the power of the living God inside you. You have a residence, a citizenship in a far greater place than this, and this is a pretty great place. And so that, that fear that we have, that remorse, that, that anxiety about the way we're looked at or perceived, we should just throw all that out the window. And again, it's a pastor standing in a pulpit and making it sound really easy, right? But we all fight with this in our own lives. And so we're using Daniel as an example of how we do this in our life. First, go to your quiet place. He went straight to his house. He hit his knees and he approached God. Pray, people. Petition. Give him thanks for all the great things he's done for you. Ask him to deliver you through whatever this trial or this persecution may be. So this king is in recognition that there is something special about Daniel, and that specialness is the spirit of the living God who is pouring over Daniel and into Daniel and giving him wisdom beyond belief. So when the king hears of this news, he immediately knows that he's going to have to take Daniel. He's going to have to cast him into this lion's den because he had written that, and it's it's been decreed there's no going back from it. So immediately he's distressed in his mind, and he's, he's trying to figure out a way to deliver Daniel. And even until sunset, it says, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Verse 15 says, Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed king was basically handcuffed by his own signature. There's nothing he can do about it. He wrote it into law. Now he has to cast what he knows to be a great man into the lion's den. But pay attention to this king in his heart because the story gets better. Then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. This is a pagan king. This is a king that worships false gods. Recognizing the power of Daniel's God. It makes you wonder, like, why didn't he just convert? Right? Just convert. Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. A stone was brought out and laid over the mouth of the den. Does the stone sound familiar? And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. See, they tried to do the same thing to Jesus. They put that stone, they put their seal on it, placed a few guards. They didn't want anybody messing with it. They didn't want anybody coming in and and robbing the grave or giving people false hope. But when we're talking about God and we're talking about the spirit of God and the power of God, those stones are just pebbles. They don't stay. He just brushes them on on out the way. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no entertainment was brought before him as as he was sleeping, as his sleep fled from him, I'm sorry. Verse 19 says, then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near to the den, he cried out for Daniel with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you? That's good. I love the fact that this is a a sermon given by an unbeliever. 
And it's so powerful and convicting to those of us who believe. God is good that way. He uses whoever he wants, whenever he wants to. He was using this pagan king to glorify himself. It's amazing. Just imagine what he can do with you if you allow him to. Verse 21 says, Then Daniel spoke to the king. O king, live forever. My God sent his angels and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me. Inasmuch as I was, bless you, inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also towards you, O king, I have committed no crime. Angels came and just closed the mouth of those lions. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. See, he couldn't, he couldn't stop from throwing him in there. God wasn't going to let anything happen to him. But man, he was rejoicing in the fact that he got to bring Daniel back out. Not only that, but God has a, has a funny way of um, justice, right? He has a funny way of allowing justice to take its course. So as the king is excited and has the ability now to say, Daniel, come out of there, I followed my own decree that my signature made me follow by throwing you in, and now I get to pull you out, and then watch what he does. Daniel was taken up from the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he had what? Trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders, and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel, and they cast them, their children, and their wives into the lion's den. Now remember, Daniel was tossed into the lion's den. God closed the mouths of those lions and not a scratch was on him when he emerged from that den. This is what normally happens when people go into a lion's den. Read, watch what it says. It says, their wives into the lion's den and they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. That's crazy thinking the lion's going to eat them, but yeah, there's a lot of crushing that goes on with those lions. These are powerful, powerful beings. So they falsely accused Daniel. They tricked the king into writing a law because they knew Daniel would be faithful to his God. The law said you can't worship anything other than the king. Daniel's not. That's not what I'm going to do. When worldly law goes against biblical law, I'm going to choose biblical law. When worldly law goes against our foundation, our fundamental beliefs in Christ, then we have an obligation as believers to what? To follow biblical truth. Does that mean in following biblical truth that there will be no repercussions? No, as a matter of fact, we started off this sermon by telling you, you will be persecuted. But that doesn't give you the opportunity to shrink. You stand up for what is true, and then you let the world do to you whatever the world's going to do to you. Knowing that your God is in control, that he can deliver you if he wants to deliver you, but if not, as Daniel's saying, if not, well, I'm going to start paradise a little earlier than most. I'm going to begin eternity with my heavenly father a little sooner than most. Gosh, that's just amazing faith and strength and confidence in what? Himself, the people around him, the king's power? No, it's all that confidence and strength and belief and faith in his God. Then Darius the king wrote to all the people's nations and men of every language who were living In all the land, may your peace abound. He's going to make another decree. He's going to put his signature on something a little different. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. This is a pagan king, an unbeliever. 
But is he? Is he? It seems to me that there's a little bit of belief in what our God can do. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his dominion will be what? Forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this, Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Remember those satraps, satraps, satrappers, whatever they were? Last week in the first couple of verses, he was head of all of them. He was second in command in a pagan kingdom, serving a pagan god. And not, I'm sorry, serving a pagan king. A pagan king who served and worshipped false gods, but had a recognition of the power of Daniel's God or your God? Your God. It's the same God, by the way. It's your God. What I love about Daniel is he made this extremely personal. He had faith in his God. He prayed to his God. This wasn't just a far-off being. This was his God. It was personal. He had faith in God's ability to deliver him and pour out his many blessings on their people. So, as we in life face persecution, as we in life are challenged with things that are contradictory to our faith, what will you do? Where will you stand? How will you take that stand? And I love how in this book, Daniel gave a quiet example of his prayerful protest. He went to his house, he got on his knees, and he began to pray, knowing that the only source that could solve any of these problems was his God. Doesn't say you have to be loud about it. Doesn't say you have to do anything different. Go to the source. Go to the only one who can help. And then follow his will. He may tell you to get loud. He may tell you to do something different. But Daniel knew immediately to go to his quiet place and seek his God. I pray that we all have the same wisdom as the world throws its hatred and its persecution and its evil at us. I pray that we know that we are in a battle each and every day. And not just with flesh and blood, the scriptures tell us that. It's, it's principalities, man. It's the, it's the spirit, it's the evilness in this world. And so we have to be guarded and ready. We have to strap on that full armor of God each and every day. We have to be ready for battle. But the cool thing is we don't have to swing the sword. We hit our knees and we pray to our God and we allow him to serve out his justice. And he will in due time. Vengeance is his, the Bible says that. So in the face of adversity, seek him first. Go to the source. And never let the world dictate how it is you live out your faith. Be bold, be confident. Most importantly, have the faith, the trust of Daniel in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. As we started off this, uh, the, the service, this is the day that you have made. Gosh, we rejoice and we're glad in it. Thank you for your people. Thank you for um, the blessing of our church family being here this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you are the great deliverer, that you are the great provider. Lord, I pray for wisdom and discernment as we as believers go out into the world to be that light. I pray, Lord, that as we share your truth, we would then expect the persecution. We would expect attacks from the enemies, and we would be well prepared. We would never lose sight of what your word says, and that's that the world hates us. But that's okay, 
because we are overcomers, because you have already overcome all of this. With your death on the cross, you said it is finished. And for those who have trusted in you, we will live in paradise throughout eternity. I thank you, Lord, that you can use us to glorify yourself, that you can use a pagan king to bring glory to your own name. Continue to use us. Thank you for making us useful in your kingdom building. Thank you for using filthy rags like us to carry out your purpose. We are extremely blessed by you, and I pray, Lord, that our time here today has been a blessing to you. In your name we pray. Stand. Let's close in worship. And this is uh, and one of those interesting songs. And sometimes I feel like I talk too much to you guys. Uh, thank you for being patient with me if you think that I talk too much. I really appreciate your patience. But that's how I process. So we sang the song last week. It's called The Blessing. And Aaron stood before God's people and he blessed them. He said, Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Um, and it just became this blessing, this thing that God's people would, would pray, they, they could anchor their lives to. Now, it's a, it's a prayer that's interesting because it's not primarily a personal prayer. It's the Lord bless you. So when I sing this song, I'm not praying for me. I'm praying for you. Right here, like the people in this room. So this is one of those songs that you could awkwardly stare around and you could just stare at somebody like, man, the Lord bless you and keep you. <laughs> Todd's like, no, nah, buddy, we're right here. <laughs> man, and then there's just, it's just such a rich song. It's, it's so many scriptures that are just packed into this one. That's the primary one that, that drives it. So I want us to, as, as we get ready to, to leave, you know, we, we have this regular gathering. We, we come together and we celebrate Jesus's life and, and what he's doing in us. And, and we want to be encouraged and rejuvenated and then go out and live like everything we said today is true. Right? We don't want to show up and be and just cross our fingers and hope this Jesus stuff works out. And we're just trying to get some holy dust sprinkled on our, on our life. Okay, he's not a fairy. This is true. And if it's true, then you bank your life on it and you live like it's true. And we come together to remind ourselves of that. We sing our story, who we are, who God is, and what we're called to do. So, man, I, I just, I couldn't think of a better way to close the service than just, man, the Lord bless you. You know, the root word of blessing is happiness. The Lord make you happy. A lot of times happiness is, uh, it's hard to nail down, right? Scripture says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. It's in Psalm. Psalm 16 says, in your presence there's fullness of joy. Your love is better than life, Psalm 63. The Lord bless you, make you happy, make you joyful. That only comes through following him and keep you. All right, I, don't wanna, I don't want momentary happiness for you. I don't want momentary faithfulness for, for you. I want eternal. I want to do this 10,000 years from now right here. Folks in this room, times a million. Scripture says there, every tribe, every tongue, millions upon millions singing God's praise. I want to be there. And I want to be there with you. Not like generic people that you see in those stock photos or websites. I want to see you there. Make his face shine upon you. I don't want you to just know about God. I, I want you to know him. I want you to see him. I want you to love him. I want you to want that for me. Let's pursue that together. I talked enough, man. Can we pray together? We're going to sing, but we're going to pray. You understand? Cool. your people. Would you bless us in our time together? Now sing this with me. Lord bless you and keep you make you 
his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face on you and give you peace. Let's sing that again. Just declare it this morning. Come on. The Lord bless you. His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face on you and give you peace. And so we agree this morning and we sing amen. Come on, you know it. you. Come on, sing it to somebody. children and their children, children and their children. children come on make his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with he is with you in the morning and the evening, and you're coming and you're going, and you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 he is for you. children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning and the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you, 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 he is for you.
Father, we just ask your special blessing over folks that are in this room. Would you keep us? And we know that you promised to. We're just agreeing what you say about us. We lean into the truth that you are good and you're God. Would you give us peace and persecution? Would you give us faith to believe what you say? And live like it's true. We pray that in your name as your people and everybody said, hey, man, dude, we love you. Sorry about the lyrics. You didn't get to sing like two whole bars with us. We'll fix it next time we sing it. Hope the message of the song still came through. We love you. We'll see you next week. You don't have to leave right away. You can hang out and talk to folks. Man, grace and peace. We'll see y'all. Peace out.